Um, so hi, everyone. I've had the chance to speak to you a couple of times now, um, uh, once in my capacity as a member of the Force 11 board, um, another time as the co-chair of this meeting with you and AD and your uh, friendly neighborhood slide fixer. So um, nice to be here now as eLife's head of external relations. We. Um, we're grateful to the program committee for including us in the program, for giving us a chance to speak about the Libro suite and Libro publisher in particular. Um, we think that Force 11 is the right place to be talking about new, uh, new ways to think about infrastructure for science communication, for research um, communication and publishing. So looking forward to your feedback today. So the focus of uh, the discussion today is Libro Publisher, and Libro is just one component of an end-to-end, -end, um, community-driven, open-source system for publishing. And by, what I mean by that is a system that encompasses the point of the author's submission of a manuscript to the journal through a peer review, typesetting, hosting, and publishing. It, this system is being built today in, uh, by eLife in concert with a number of different organizations. Just some of them are, are named here. So if you've heard any talks from Hindawi recently, I'm not sure if Katrina is still around, uh, they present uh, their version of this work under the name of Phenom. Um, you have probably heard uh, Coco um, and Adam and Kristen gave a, co a keynote at Force 11 last year. It's all the same stuff. We're just approaching it from, from different angles and with different, slightly different sets of needs needs. So um, by open source, uh, I mean not only that the code is openly available on GitHub and you can poke at it and interact with it, but that it's also supported by a vibrant and active community of users under an agreed set of terms and conditions to, to govern that use. We propose this as a better alternative to the options that we've had to date for, for publishing infrastructure. And those options have been to buy, which is to you know, uh, outsource this option and get a, a vendor to support you. And that can be costly. Um, and it can uh, often end up getting locked in with a single provider. And then you, you stand in line for features that um, can help your publishing platform to be more modern. So that's just not optimal when we're talking about uh, enhancing research communication and helping scholars do more with the results more quickly. The other option is, of course, to build it yourself. And that's expensive. Um, it's a, a huge upfront investment. And then you take on the burden of ongoing maintenance, upkeep. And then you're responsible all of a sudden for keeping up to date with the latest technologies and features, which is another type of burden. So the solution is that we all do it together. So um, we propose that this open source approach gives us both the stability and the reliability that we all want for the long term, but also the efficiency and the responsiveness that we need in the now. So this is not a new thing, um, what I'm describing. So there are established practices and policies from across the open source uh, software development community, which we have researched and adopted for our purposes. So Neil, this is where I get you ready to pop in uh, as needed. In the case of Libro Publisher, we have adopted an approach uh, with documented terms whereby eLife, the organization, is the steward of the code and not any individual. And we work with the advice of a steering committee and a number of special interest groups. So um, again, want to flag Neil because the Software Sustainability Institute was one of the organizations that we consulted in developing our, our approach here. Um, and then I'm not sure how familiar you, got, how familiar you guys are with Linux, but as I understand it, that was a situation where one person was the steward for the code and it became problematic. So we hope that by naming eLife as an organization as the steward that will avoid the, the difficulties of having one person as the gatekeeper. And I can speak to this in a little bit more detail if you're interested, but we've also adopted a model whereby we maintain much more control over the core code but then there are extensions which have a little bit less control and then there are third party extensions which anyone can build. So a good example, um, you probably know that eLife is an open access publisher and so Libro Publisher is built in the first instance to support open access publishing. But through this software development model, someone can come and build a subscription gateway and plug it into the software as a third party extension, that's fine. So with this approach, um, we hope to um, hit that right balance of accountability and freedom to give people the flexibility they need to help the, the code to grow and to thrive. 
So the software itself is licensed under MIT, which is on the, the more per permissive side of the spectrum. And we use a contributor license agreement to govern contributions to the code under the model I just described with the, the core code, the extensions, and the, the third party components. Um, and we use the CLA to try and ensure that the licensing is consistent in the long term and that we don't run into any issues with the reuse later on. So we want the whole package, that's the end game, by the way, is right for the whole package to be used by another organization. We don't want any of the, the copyrights to inhibit use of any of the individual components of the core, especially. And as you know, um, a key to the longevity of an open source uh, project in particular is that it's actually used. So in this case, eLife Hendawi and the International Journal of Microsimulation, which is an economics journal, are poised to adopt components of Libro Publisher, if not the full package. Obviously, eLife will adopt the, the full package when it's um, complex enough to support us. The plan for support um, is important too. Um, it is not uh, the plan to have everyone call eLife uh, when they need help, but rather that we will recruit a layer of service providers who will compete for your business, who will compete for the business of, of publishers who want to use the software for their purposes. So to anticipate a question from the left-hand side of the room later on, um, what we need is to get the product ready for other organizations to use. So I'm going to describe the state of development in just a moment. But, but in the meantime, we are talking to potential service providers who can help um, provide the support necessary for publishers to use this. So we've been talking to production vendors who um, may already provide hosting and uh, content delivery as part of their offering or who might be thinking about it because they've got the development capacity to support something like this. And we've also been speaking to... Um, uh, I, what I want to call ISPs, you know, um, uh, organizations who, who provide support for all types of different software, open source packages, maybe Moodle, maybe Civi, but just have um, competencies in the languages that we're using and could um, open this up for uh, small operations, individual journals perhaps. And we've been talking to some organizations that are established and trusted partners of the um, publishing community today. I don't know if Theo is in the room, um, but Theo made that point very clearly to me, you know, that if we're talking about moving respected, long-established journals to a new platform, we're not going to work with a partner that we don't know. So we have spoken to a number of organizations that you'll recognize um, to and who have the development capacity and the relationship with publishers to support this in the long term. So hopefully when the thing is ready to go, that um, you'll have a few different phone numbers to call for information. So this is what it looks like, uh, we think, in the, in, the end, in the end game. We've got the community of people who are actually developing on the core code, adding features, et cetera. We've got service providers who may contribute um, development uh, time as well, but whose primary role is to provide support to university presses, library publishers, small publishers, big publishers, and societies. Now, what I wanted to do here also is draw a dotted line from big publisher to Libro community because we want those types of organizations contributing to building the software in a direction that, um, that will support them. So I'm going to take you back to what it is we're building exactly. And as a reminder, we're talking about a full suite in the end. But the focus today is that just that bit on the right-hand side. So we are working on something that we call Libro Reviewer, I think Kendawi calls it Phenom Reviewer. We are working on um, Libro Producer, but uh, with a focus on author proofing and, uh, and then the, the content delivery side. So let's take a look at that. What we're building toward, um, to, if I could describe it, it looks a lot like eLife. So this is the, the, the presentation we're working toward. This is the type of complexity. This is the type of look and feel that Libro Publisher will support. E-Life has been um, extensively user tested and refined um, for fast online consumption of research. Um, but what we learned with eLife is once we'd finished developing this technology, this thing that you've seen online at eLife for two and a half years, is that nobody else could use it. So it was just too, too specific to us. All of the, all of the tags and the categories were written for very you know, detailed subsets of biomedical research. So it was really too difficult to unpick it and use it for someone in, in any other discipline, really. 
So we went back to the to the drawing um, board and started over. But this is the the visual side that's user tested. It wor it's, it works. We know it does. So we just want to plug that on to um, to the uh, the data model that we developed for Libro Publisher. I want to go back to um, what Rachel said earlier as well. You know, it's a slightly different um, angle on the on the the point, but she said that user experience is core. Right? If we want to get user adoption of new services and and tools, helping them to have a great experience is really important in that. So we believe we've started that with the kind of research consumption side that happens on our journal site, but it's a methodology that we're taking through the. Um, the systems that we're developing for submission, peer review, and production. So we want our staff to have the same ease and joy of interacting with the systems. Uh, we think that it's just going to make everything that much more efficient and enjoyable for, um, for everyone who's doing the work. So with this presentation, um, you'll notice that it's lovely that it's clean and it's clear. There are also full color images. I just didn't put one up for you. There's no distracting site furniture. Um, it, it, the intent is to encourage the reader to move through information in, a, in an order of priority. Details are linked up. So you see the, the blue computational systems biology. Um, you click on that and it goes to a new um, uh, set of content uh, that focuses on what you want to look at. Now, these are, these are simple things. I know, I'm sure many, many other journals have them. However, there's still things that need to be built. They, they take time. They need, they need to be constructed. The research article, too, is designed to help readers quickly glean the nature of, of what they're looking at and then move efficiently through the page. Figures, videos, tables um, are, are in line for convenience. And the mobile version is just as lovely as it is quick to load. So these are modern practices that more and more in publishing, more of publishing could take advantage of. And that's the point of making the system open source so that other organizations can plug and play and then turn their talents to other areas where they can add more value. There's so much more we could do to really more, uh, more effectively take research results more uh, farther ahead more quickly. Finally, I think Emmy opted out of this, but I'll give it a try. Um, so where we've been looking at eLife, I'm going to show you Libro Publisher in just a second, but um, once Libro Publisher is built up to the level of complexity of eLife, we can start to do cool new things with it. So just to give you a flavor of um, where we're headed, here's something cool and new that we're, that we're building for eLife. So it's something that we call the reproducible document stack, and uh, what we're doing right now is, uh, is building up our um, submission peer review and production systems to be able to support submissions of this nature, but basically they preserve the code and the data associated with the paper so that when the reader actually gets to it, it's not just flat tables and, and flat data sets and flat figures, they can actually tinker with um, the uh, with the author's results in a way that gives them a different view and they can interrogate it more, more efficiently and maybe um, find something different than the author did. So now um, this uh, here uh, commences the official demonstration of Libro Publisher. You'll see that it is um, familiar, but still not quite as complex as Libro, sorry, as eLife. So you've got the same um, clean, clear presentation. There are more articles down there, I promise. Um, you say, see the same um, white space around um, the title and author list. You see the same presentation of, of information. Um, so underneath the content listing, you get technology update. What is it that I'm looking at? The title is bigger to describe exactly you know, what um, the article is about, and then other key points that, again, we um, organize in this way through, through user testing. The article it also looks familiar to you. Um, again, it's just not quite as, as complex as what we've got on, on eLife yet. You've got the title, the author, their affiliations. Um, neuroscience is the category for the paper. And then research advances is the type. So these are uh, categories that we're building out. Uh, Melissa will be a good person to ask questions about this if you want to, but this is um, similarly um, simplified. So uh, you know that a reference list can be much more detailed than this, but just with this release, this is all we've constructed so far. So there's much more you can do with a, the with a reference list, but um, this is uh, the current presentation on, on Libro Publisher. 
and toward the bottom. Not sure if you can see that, the author keywords and the research organism. Again, these are uh, categories that can be adopted to anyone else's purposes. I think that in the code, it says something like um, red, black, blue, so that you can change it to, to anything you need to for your field. And the uh, mobile presentation is similarly mobile friendly and fast. And that's it, really. Um, you'll see it's quite familiar to eLife, so you, uh, you know where we're going, but it's just a matter of time to build all the, all the components to support the presentation. The, uh, defining the data model in particular is really, really important. We're trying, we're really trying to build a common language with other publishers so that they can get the system um, up and running more quickly. The uh, public roadmap is, is public, so you can get a sense there of, of what's next. Um, in the near-term column, you can see things like math. Supporting math will be important for a lot of different organizations, as well as um, basic search results. And that uh, the one at the top called technology adaptation is a rather broad and obscure term for um, configurability. So uh, another thing we've learned is that for another organization to be able to install and run the software, it needs to be not only generic, not too specific to eLife, but presented in a way that they understand what to do with it. So whether it's documentation or automation, how, do, how does someone actually you know, take and run um, with this technology? So some of the ways that we're, that we're approaching or some of the things we're taking into account with configurability are branding and styling. So as lovely as eLife is, you may not want to use the same fonts. You may have a different logo. You can change to ours. I really like ours, but if you don't, that's fine. I've mentioned categories a couple of times, uh, but what you put on your navigation menu, um, what type of uh, static pages you may have, all of that is, um, is important for configurability, and that's what we're building for now. In the longer term, um, we've got lots of things in mind. So um, I'm, it, it made sense um, somehow uh, to build a multilingual support sooner than later. Um, and so we already know that Libro Publisher can support uh, Japanese, Cyrillic, and Arabic. Also, oh, surprise. Uh, I didn't realize I could talk quite so long, but I shouldn't, have been, but shouldn't be surprised. Um, another thing is dashboards. So um, staff, um, despite the ability of the, of the machines to kind of ingest the content automatically and stick it into the content presentation layer, um, staff would like to have an idea of what's going on and make sure that all the figures are present and that it meets our standards for, for publishing. So we're building dashboards to support that. You'll recognize the user experience. Again, clean, clear, and helping the staff to get to what they need to um, as directly as possible. So um, to get a better sense of, of what we're up to and the state of things, you are very welcome to take a look at the website at libro.pub. Uh, we've got streams of news. The code is openly available online. On the GitHub, uh, you can contact us if you want to talk turkey, if you want to talk about how we're, uh, what we're building lines up with, with what you're after. Um, the roadmap is there as well. The libro.pub um, website is a gateway to all of these resources. So if you remember one thing, do remember that. And then um, on Slack, we've got a growing community of de developers who are very um, happy to talk about what they're up to or um, answer questions about um, how they can help. So I'm going to use my last minutes here um, to, to share a little bit about eLife. I'm not sure um, how many of you may be familiar with us, um, but there's a reason why we're, we're doing this work that I've just told you about. So eLife is a, a nonprofit organization. Um, we were started in um, 2011 by three of the uh, larger um, biomedical research funders in the world, HHMI, Wellcome Trust, and Max Planck, and our remit um, was and is to fundamentally, fundamentally change science publishing. So in biomedicine in particular, there are a number of pain points that they felt were so severe that they needed to throw a bunch of money behind finding solutions. And there are three, three main areas that we direct our work in. So open technology innovation is firmly a third of them. So it's not just building infrastructure that's going to make us um, more uh, adaptable to the needs of the future, more responsive, but it's also um, new innovation. So Emmy Sang, if you've met her through the meeting, her job is to bring in new ideas to our innovation in initiative on how people can interact with results or what more they can do online. So that's a, a constant area of inquiry for us. Community development is about supporting early career ambassadors, uh, working through FORCE, working through DORA, working through OWASPA to support the long-term adoption of open science behaviors. 
and then uh, radically improve how research is assessed and published is publishing our open access journal, uh, which is, uh, uh, supports everything in life science and biomedicine, where we uh, try and take on new approaches to how um, evaluating research, defining what is impactful for a field and that type of thing. So that is a whole other half an hour talk. At the end of the day, however, um, we want other people to leverage um, the investment that our funders have put into eLife. If we do all of these things by ourselves, then the impact that we have on the world is, is just limited. So we would like you to help inform the direction of our technology development. We'd like you to talk to us about editorial um, practices and policies so that we can learn from one another and, um, and get better faster. So um, to conclude, um, I just want to highlight that um, eLife's motivations for developing the Libro suite of technology um, is are to uh, leverage the power of web technology to accelerate research and discovery, to support open access publishing, and to build a community-owned infrastructure for research communication. If any of you want to do those things, you are very welcome to join us and work with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, any questions? Uh, yep, just over here. Hi, Joe Haveman from Africa Archive. I have two questions, I'll keep it short. Um, I, I and I think many others here were very happy about your multilingual approach. Can you elaborate on that? And like personally, I as a provider for a preprint service for the African continent, but I think that the same applies for, for Europe. Um, would be interested to have a service that allows for translation of at minimum the abstract of research articles, not necessarily only the interface of the service, which is already great, but like the actual content. I think that's what we, you were also referring to. Um, so language diversity and also integration of the various preprint services, if that's, maybe I missed that part, sorry. Well, what was the second part? So I, th I think I understand the, the connection between preprints and, and uh, presenting content in different languages, but what was the second no, part of your comment? No, it's two separate questions. Mm -hmm. Like how, like if you see a chance to kind of work with the variety of preprint services that we have today, if you see a future of collaboration of some sort and standardization, like if you're in talks with some of us and um, yeah, but first the language diversity maybe? Or both are important. Anyway. Okay, well, let me take the preprint first. Um, so uh, we completely support a preprint uh, deposit um, and have ex uh, relationships now with BioArchive where if you uh, deposit uh, your, your preprint there, if you publish there, then you could submit to eLife on the same point. And the, the uh, converse is true. If you submit to eLife, we invite you to, to publish, um, submit to BioArchive at the same moment. So we totally, totally support that. Um, the Libro publisher, um, is a content delivery face and system, so it depends on XML. Uh, so we need the XML to come in. Any, any preprints that exist in PDF need to be into XML before we can support it, but we would love to explore that further. And on the, the multilingual support, if I understand correctly um, the, the state of us, if we have the XML in uh, Japanese or a Cyrillic language or, um, or Arabic, then Libro Publisher will support it. However, we, I'm not sure we have um, Cyrillic or Arabic or Japanese reading staff, and so we need some help to make sure that the system isn't screwing up th anything up badly. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, really two questions, actually. Uh, the first question is, how is the interaction working with OJS? I saw you had PKP up um, as one of the partners. What is its relationship to uh, existing OJS systems? And I guess actually a question raised by Joe's question um, and, and your answer. Um, to what degree are those elements like uh, conversion to XML, um, uh, well, actually mostly that, handled inside the system? Or is that just like an OJS, you have to go outside the system to get your XML and then bring it back in? Um, so um, Juan and Melissa are casting a clear eye on me, so I'll make sure and do my best. Um, but so we outsource our conversion as well. So um, off the back of our peer review system, we get uh, different formats that are not XML, and so we, we outsource it to Exeter Premedia. So, um, so we do that ourselves at eLife. 
and the relationship with OJS is that we're working on um, uh, improving production processes at the moment. Um, in particular, I mean, OJS has been quite active in looking at substance tools, texture, you know, other um, open source options between peer review and publishing where um, we've been talking at length for some time and hopefully co-developing solutions in future. Juan, would you like to add? <laughs> Um, any other questions? Um, okay, well, I, I had a question, okay. uh, which was based on a talk that we had earlier. But so are there plans to implement the credit taxonomy as part of the journal or part of the platform? Okay, Melissa will correct me if I get this wrong. I believe that we have credit implemented at eLife now, and therefore we will look to Im implement it for Libro Publisher in future. Sorry, hold on for the mic. Okay. Thanks. Um, there is a JAPS for our recommendation out there for how you should tag um, credit taxonomy within XML. We have not done that yet, but we are planning to do that. One of there is a slight problem with the credit taxonomy that I've been banging on with every uh, to anyone who'll listen about. Um, and once that's fixed, then we'll be able to do it. I believe we do have another solution for author attribution in place at eLife, which uh, helps to give credit to all the, the people aside from first author and, and corresponding author, because we think that's really important. Okay. And uh, uh, Melissa Harrison is eLife's head of production, so ask all the further hard questions of her. Uh, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, we'll call uh, an end to that there. Thank you very much again, Jennifer. Thank you. Um,